Hey everybody, I'm Rick Beata. I'm here with Christian Henson from Spitfire Audio. Christian, I've known for uh, probably the last year or so, or not quite a year. Yeah. I've known him actually far longer than that since his company, Spitfire Audio. I've been a huge fan of They've been around for 11 years. And you make virtual instruments. Largely orchestral. Virtual. Largely orchestral. Yeah. Christian's also a YouTuber, and he has one of my favorite YouTube channels, and you should definitely subscribe to it right now. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. And, it, and his YouTube channel is about music. It's somewhat related to his business, but not. Um, but he talks about so many different things, and many times he starts out in Scotland, where he lives. Yeah. The reason you've woken is because there's a, a nub, a notion, like an anxiety, but a tickly, tingly one, like the anxiety you get when seeing a fairy or a ladybird for the first time, or those few seconds after waking up before you realize it's Christmas Day morning. Well, my day job is I'm a film and TV composer. Mm -hmm. I've written about uh, 50 film scores with using real orchestras and a couple of hundred TV shows and a few triple games and stuff. So what I want to do here, very very common, is for the first violins to play an octave above the second violins. So all I'm going to do is simply duplicate that top line there. Poor violas, they do get to play the more boring parts. And I think what I'll also do is add in the woodwind legatos at the top. Great stuff. Let's just add a bit to this uh, middle accompanying section. But I didn't go to music college, I don't read music. So uh, I basically used technology to kind of challenge that paradigm of the conservatoire education. And uh, I work on lower budget stuff and I struggled with orchestral samples um, because they all sounded enormous. So I hooked up with a pal of mine and we were just talking about this over a few pints in a pub in Soho. And you know how you, you come up with ideas in, in, the, in the pub or in a restaurant and you're gonna, this is gonna change the world, all that, and then you do nothing about it. <laughs> Well, this guy, Paul, he's a get up and goer. So he's like, next morning he was off. Part of the composing fraternity, I had a lot of A-list friends. Harry Gregson Williams was one of the first adopters, uh, David Arnold, John Powell. And instead of making commercial business, we thought we'd just do like a private club, uh, which was kind of successful. So we've basically, in the first two years, we had about 30 uh, users, but then the, the pressure to become a commercial enterprise really took off. The basis behind the company is, was when we were using samples back in the day not only did they sound too big so we decided to do like chamber bands that kind of stuff but also I just noticed that people recorded samples differently from how they recorded music mm -hmm. and because I was recording a lot of music doing orchestral scores and a bit of production not to the scale of, of, of your productions but um, I just questioned well, why don't you just record it the same way as you record music and lo and behold it turns out that it works out better that way. So we're very much about capturing the rooms that we're recording. Okay, so let's uh, have a play of that. I always find sampling instrument. I expected that to sound so much better, particularly down here. You can hear there's a lot of that stuff, a lot of information in there. And we largely record at Air Studios in the hall, which you visited today. Mm -hmm. um, and we use these amazing musicians in Britain uh, playing these amazing instruments. And it's, it's become these, you know, they say, how do you make God laugh? Tell him your plans. And uh, Spitfire has just become this phenomenal odyssey, really. And there's now 70 people working for, with Spitfire. And, uh, but also I'm getting to collaborate with other composers doing sample libraries for them, which we release. So we've worked with Hans Zimmer and Olafur Arnold and Roger Taylor from Queen. We recorded him at Headley Grange and members of the Chili Peppers and all of that stuff. So it's been just the most incredible journey. Talk about how Spitfire has interfaced with YouTube and then your journey into 
being a YouTuber? Well, it's interesting because I started dabbling with YouTube because the, the company was like two or three people. Uh, my business partner, Paul, was doing all the technical side of stuff and then we got some assistance for him. But I was doing all of the artwork and stuff because I was marginally better at Photoshop than him. <laughs> and uh, so I kind of created the brand. I had this company sitting on the shelf and for tax purposes, we needed a, like a shell company to put through. So I said, well, I'll just call it Spitfire Audio and I'm a proud Brit and I like YouTube utilitarian World War II stuff so we kind of did it with that and we set up the YouTube channel simply as a place to house our tutorial videos mm -hmm. and our pr promotional material but it doesn't take long playing YouTube before you start going what? why isn't that viewed as much as that and why isn't that liked as much as that so that began our kind of journey on YouTube and in fact we started making a lot of non-promotional material on the Spitfire site I started this series called, I don't know if you remember MTV Cribs? Yeah, Composer Cribs. Hi, I'm Harry Gregson Williams and Spitfire arrived at my door, so I thought, well, I could leave them on the doorstep, but probably best to bring them in. We're excited here because uh, we've just installed our brand new Avid S6. Today's Cribs has an epic feel. A man who is redefining what it is to go big, John Paisano. Hey John, how are you doing? Good, You're right. welcome. Thanks Come so on. much for having us. Come on. <gasps> this is a wonderful space. Yeah, thank you. I, I love the composer cribs because you never know what other composers or yeah. producers, what their studios look like. You always Absolutely. wonder. Absolutely. Home studios, I mean, most of these are really decked out professional <laughs> studios, but they're, they, it's surprising how different they are one from another. Absolutely. And I think we're still in this strange age where a lot of really big composers are kind of working in studios that they've built themselves. Yeah. So there's, a, there's always a bit of gaff at uh, duct tape, you know, holding something together <laughs> at the back or a weird thing, workflow they've adopted. But after a while of doing these composers' cribs, what I found is like, well, we can only show a manly massive passive so many times. So what happened is we started sitting down and just talking about life as a composer. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly realized that that is what people were really interested in. There's something quite isolated about being a media composer. I think probably producing as well can be, you know, long hours, isolated. And just to share experiences with people is where I feel that our community within Spitfire Audio really kicked off. But where my YouTube channel is concerned, basically I moved to Scotland and I've got this volcano that starts in the back of my garden. Everything that we do, the tools that we operate, are to do with sound. If they don't sound good, it's pointless. It's valueless. It is of no value to us. And I guess where sounding good is concerned, what also falls into this category, I guess if it's a musical instrument, is that it plays well, that it doesn't require a huge amount of effort to make it sound good. Your editing is excellent. I mean, it's really you have a great you have, you're like a pro youtuber i mean that's the funny thing is is that you i don't know if you watched a lot of youtube videos but you really know how to make a youtube video his videos look far better than mine of course that's not setting a very high bar <laughs> But although this one looks great because I'm not filming it, <laughs> talk about your process because you do a lot of quick edits. You're, you're on a volcano. Next thing you're in your studio. Well, my route into film composition, I always wanted to be a film composer, but I actually, uh, because I kind of flunked out of, of university and college and didn't go to music college, I, I, I downgraded my aspirations and, and got into EDM and was part of the, the, the original wave of drum and bass. Okay. So I'm a really hardcore editor by, by trade. I used to be a drum programmer for the likes of Ann Dudley and uh, Patrick. Doyle. What I found is you edit the audio is how you edit the video. Exactly. It's, 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 it's about this. It's yeah. not necessarily about the imagery. The reason why I introduced the fast cutting stuff is because I basically didn't have time to make YouTube videos. I'd basically be traveling from Scotland to London doing a day's work here at Spitfire and then traveling back the same day from London to Scotland. And I thought, well, there's quite a lot of dead time whilst I'm traveling. So if I just do it in little bits and then edit together. So I just say each line twice and edit between them. So you'll see Christian walking through an airport, getting out of a cab, walking on a volcano, <laughs> in his studio, yeah. in London, he's in LA, he's wherever, and it can all be in the same video. Yeah, exactly. My favorite is the transatlantic jump cut. So where I go, uh, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not actually here, I'm here. And then you kind of carry on talking, you go, but first, and then you do the whole journey to get to that jump cut. When you're getting out of a cab, you have to be holding your yeah. vlogging camera like that to do it. Yeah. But you're so pro at it. never occurs to me, oh, Christian's got his arm sticking out there. Oh, it's so and then you're walking through groups of people yeah. in an airport. 
You say that it doesn't... That oh, I'm in full fight or flight mode. <laughs> you know, I mean, I rehearse the lines because I'm just saying to myself, keep going, keep going, keep going. Ignore, ignore them. And what I find incredible is people will literally walk past you and, and heckle you, go, wake up! And people in, in London and really don't like... They don't like vloggers. They haven't got... It's like, it's like, for me, it's like the early days of mobile phones, you know, and uh, so there's a lot of heckling and I like challenging myself. And, you know, something I, I, I don't, I think it's, it's very common for us musicians. I think that, uh, you know, a lot of us don't have huge amounts of self-esteem. It's what kind of forces us into our bedroom and makes us practice guitar and stuff. Um, so as a consequence, uh, uh, where the vlogging's concerned, my determination comes from being able to outwork. I've been very conscious not to be too negative because often you get middle-aged people kind of going, oh, you don't want to do this. I really encourage people to do it. Some things you've talked about about for example, how much you make as a film composer yeah, or a person makes as a film composer, or how you make money as a yeah. film composer. Things that, unless you actually do it or know people that do it, which yeah. you know the top people in the business, you would have no way of knowing Absolutely. what people make. And I think what I'm it. hoping from that is people do the sums because people have this idea, and I don't want, I, I can't really speak for America. In, in this country, you know, earning money out of music, media composition particularly, is really tough. So with that particular video, what people have done is they've done the sums and they've gone, well, how do you support a family? And you go, well, you have to do 15 projects at a time. Right. And th so that's the reality. But also, I'm just very conscious that the music industry really doesn't look after uh, its talent. From the 60s all the way through to Amy Winehouse and yeah. Johan Johansson. There's a real issue here. And so one of the reasons I actually walk up the volcano is just to try and kind of remind people it's probably good to get out and about and it's an inspiring place and all that kind of stuff. But the key thing for me also is, is that, and this is something that I think you and I have been talking over about for the last couple of days, is I often when I do seminars at music colleges get people to put up their hands of what doors they use and I'm always really pleased that they use Pro Tools because it's the only universal door that we have. Then ask them to put their hands up and say who's taught you how to make business plans and no hands ever go up. And the problem is that there's this thing of all you have to do to make a business in music is to make music, but you don't. You have to make a music business. You are the business. And I think that that's something I try and get to in, in the vlog, and that is something that isn't talked about enough. The successful acts in the modern era, whether it be Coldplay or U2, are brilliant business people or they have brilliant business people. I would actually go even back further. The Rolling Stones and Pretty much every huge band that's that lasted for more than 10 years yeah. were good business people. Absolutely. I think that a lot of people that watch my channel that are music producers mm -hmm. would get a lot out of your channel as Thank well. You. you have a video that you've done recently about why samples sound great tuned mm -hmm. down. And that's, that was a really big video for it you. Was, uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was a big surprise. It came out of nowhere suddenly. Yeah, you like, do videos like that. Usually I try and do three a week and I, I did one which I thought was more interesting which was me making a choir out of rolling some ice across a frozen loch as they call them in Scotland and um, <laughs> I get criticised when I say loch. Uh, but this one I think well what I could gather it answered a question that hadn't maybe been answered and that people are interested in and I guess that's what I've learnt with my odyssey with Spitfire but also my YouTube channel is is that what I really love is, is making sounds. From meeting hundreds of composers around the world, I would say about 10% of composers are really into making sounds. Hans and Olafur are one in the same in the sense that they understand the emotion that you can convey in a single sound. But also, we're all procrastinators, aren't we? And I think a, an awesome way of procrastinating is to make, make your little sound libraries, or da as Daniel Lanois calls them, his little sound orphans. Make little orphanages and find them a home eventually. And so that's what I'll often do, that horrible point when you're starting a new movie or a new TV series, a new franchise, and you just really don't want to kind of stare the monster in the face or eat the frog, as they call it. And, and so what I tend to do is, is, is gently ease my way in by actually creating a little sound set. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, you know, talking about helping with the, the health of the community, the writer's block and the fear of starting can be a, have a real impact on people's mental health. So I'm a real evangelist about making your own sample libraries because I believe if you make something unusual, that'll often be all the inspiration you need. When I first started producing, I did a lot of my own samples mm -hmm. and would load things into samplers. That used to be very common, but I don't think it's common as much anymore and I don't know why. Well one they weren't commercially available really widely. Um, they, you know, it's kind of distorted reality 
shifted things up yeah. with spectrosonics and stuff. I think that they had they had limited sampling capabilities, mm -hmm. um, so you had to be a little bit more creative with these things. But also they were boxes, very expensive boxes. Yes. And I think that's what we've noticed at Spitfire Audio is the concept of, for example, contact for younger people is quite tricky because it's a sampler. Right, so it just plays the sounds. It's a slightly disconnected yeah. process now, whereas before it was you plugged things into your sampler, yeah. hit record, and then and scroll then you around. mess around with the Absolutely. sound. Yeah. That's what I think. But also because of well, because of companies like Spitfire, we there's so many sample libraries out there and Splice and all of this kind of stuff. But um, I think one of the the biggest challenges of being you know a music maker is to be original, to be yourself. And what better way to be yourself than to use something that definitely no one else has? You yeah. Know? And I think that that's, you know, you talk about the Axe, the Fractal Audio things and stuff, but you have your amp collection. And that, that combination of that and that combination of mics, no one can copy because it's in your room. And, yeah. You know. but, I, but I also don't shy away from any type of digital sure. versions of these things either. They all have their place, absolutely. Uh, and whatever fits into your workflow, I think, is the most important thing. Absolutely. If you're in a time crunch, yep. setting up your Marshall stack is probably not the uh, no, no. It probably not the most practical use of your time when you can no. pull up your Axe Effects or whatever. But what I found interesting, I totally agree with you, Rick. But um, I do a lot of writing on the train down from Scotland. Mm -hmm. In fact, I did an entire very big TV series, a big orchestral series, called Toots and Carmen. And I wrote that entirely on a train, which was an amazing experience with hard drives these days and, you know, the, the CPUs being able to process the reverbs and that was absolutely fine. But what I was able to do with sampling was take some of my stuff from my studio with me that's personal to me, yeah. my piano, my little charanga. All of okay, that so how do you do that, though? What, how, what is your setup when you're on a train? I just have a, a, a Mac, Mac Pro yep. and then I have a small portable keyboard I think the tricky things with portable keyboards is not many of them have sustain, and I'm a sustain pedal tart. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so you've got to find one with a sustain pedal in, and then I have this, I actually use a, um, a little, it's a photography thing called a palette gear as my controller, because with orchestral samples you need to control expression and yeah. dynamics. Um, so I have that on the desk, and then I just have this Samsung 4 terabyte drive that's about that big and it's just ins and that's my entire sample library all of my spitfire samples and uh, that's me running picture within logic and i do everything it's in unbelievable logic. Yeah, it is insane I mean, really, uh, really and amazing. looking out of the window as you scream down the east coast which is a very beautiful train journey like writing with orchestras playing real orchestras yeah. is just i've never taken your, a class a, own world. like that's pretty it's pretty pretty far out i think yeah how many libraries do you have right now, different sample libraries with Spitfire? It's about 70 now. Okay. Uh, which is, it's, it's been a big, big journey. Um, and, uh, but again, I think that the difference between us and, and, and possibly some other sample libraries, there are other sample libraries that are run by composers, um, fantastic ones. But by and large, they tend to be tech companies. So what I've found is instead of going, what do you guys want? We, as composers, go, uh, you should try this. I think you're going to like this. For example, I was doing a film called The Go-Between, and um, the first image was a the, the director was having a bit of a mid midlife Terence Malick moment, and the, it was this swaying grass, you know, thin red line grass, and it was the English countryside. And part of the character, because it's a kind of a sexual thriller, Part of the character of this drama was the fact that it was really hot. And obviously in England, that's a rarity. So to see English countryside and swaying kind of wheatgrass or whatever uh, didn't maybe imply heat. So he said, we need to get heat through the music, which is that's quite a difficult thing to convey. So I thought, well, what, what would be interesting was to go to air studios and record 24 mandolins doing slow tremolandi. And what was incredible about that is you were able with 24 guitars to create a sustained note out of something that is plucked and it worked. So we made a library out of it. And that's an example of, well, I thought of something because I was given a problem. And we also have these, these things called Evo grids, which are um, organic sounds that change over time. And that was born of me working on a thing called Sinbad, where they were asking me to uh, basically compose, orchestrate and produce 24 minutes of orchestral music a day. And uh, and we were never going to use a real orchestra. And it had to sound good and all that kind of stuff. And I thought, well, how am I going to be able to eat my lunch? 
And so uh, I came up with the idea of this Evo grid where I could hold a C minor chord, put my foot down, and it would change and evolve and keep your attention whilst I was eating a sandwich. <laughs> and that became our Evo grids have been very popular. We've done one with uh, Olaf Reynolds and with Eric Whitaker, the choral composer. When I'm listening to a film score, how much of them are samples these days? I think that people tend to use a mixture these days. And I think that what I've learned is to pick, pick my battles. So I think the, uh, because of sampling technology, film scores have become very rich, not from a old school John Williams lots of notes, but just from a lot of layering. So for example, I'll often have maybe a six, six part harmony in the kind of mid range, and then I'll double up harmonics on top to give it a kind of a sheen and stuff like that. What I've learned, I can see other people are doing the same, is, is you work out what the samples can do adequately mm -hmm. and what the samples really can't do. I still find melodic lines in strings incredibly difficult to, yeah. to fake. Even if it's just one player, it makes all the difference. But I'm not going to divisy up a 30-piece string section to play some harmonics up at the top. So I think it's a matter of picking your bat battles. I think people have uh, become accustomed to the very rich sound of samples um there's something you can't especially in the low register yeah, low, the basses, things like that that when you're playing low c's and things like that that completely. you you hear in a movie theater that sound massive that, that maybe a real string section might not sound quite that big well it's it's, it's impossible to uh, recreate those circumstances because if you imagine that lowest c in the basses is uh you know uh, maybe 20, no, so what would it be? Maybe six basses and 20 microphones and one hall. And then you add the cellos, and that's suddenly that's going to be 16 players, 40 microphones, two halls. But then if you divisi the celli, it's suddenly it's I can't my maths aren't very good. It's 46, <laughs> 46, 60, <laughs> and three halls. So this this in huge resonating power of a hall you're duplicating. You can never create that in real life, and that's where I think the romance of sampling exists. There are several things that, as you've experienced coming up to where studio today, it's it's quite a mundane process recording, you know, music one note at a time. Yeah, but. There are some romantic elements to it. One is, you know, to be able to do stuff that you can't do in real life. Something that fascinates hands that you can take uh, like a silk fan and tap it and it's bigger than any Tycho drum, you know, and, but you can artificially, you know, amplify that. Um, you know, there are, there are regrettably uh, um, some players that we have sampled who are no longer with us and they are performing on scores that were written after their demise. And I think my favourite story is my, my youngest brother, Keaton, is a fantastic singer-songwriter. I sampled him when he was 12, before his voice broke, for this kind of scary horror movie I was doing. And um, it, he's planning to do a duet with himself when he was 12, but obviously singing a composition he's written in 2019. That's time travel. Wow. Yeah, so there's a romance to it, I think. Do you think that directors get used to um, the mock-ups that they hear and yeah. they can't let go of it, they yeah. get demoitis essentially. Yeah. I, I talk about this a lot, demoitis is yeah. a real thing. And on some cues they'll say, well, let's just use the... Yeah. the, the it, uh, it, it does happen. And that actually is just going back right to the beginning of Spitfire. That was actually one of the premises of, of setting up and recording smaller bands is with lower budgets, you know, you'd have to mock up on these enormous sounding samples and then yeah. you go to the director, but it's going to sound smaller than that. Right. That's not an aperture change direction <laughs> no. that they're going to kind of adhere to. No. So it was because obviously writing chamber music has its own, there's a method to it. A great example I use is Dario Marinelli's Atonement, which a lot of people think is an epic score, but that's a chamber band, but it's just, you know, they're digging in there. Um, so, yes, I think that that does happen. I think that you can create some impossible things that happen in samples that don't happen live. And I think also, you know, samples tend to be perfectly tuned and all of that kind of stuff. And, mm -hmm. you know, suddenly you've got a clarinetist who's playing in an uncomfortable register. I th the real killers are stuff like bassoon samples where you know you've got them to play in the gods and then you've got people going Dill! like that and it's like it's, <laughs> right. it's going to be a bit tricky on the day but i i'm a great believer in in the in the hybrid use you know the musicians have been paid 
at the beginning to do the samples. So we, we're not putting musicians out of work. And Spitfire, we actually pay all of the musicians. Yeah, talk about that. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm from a showbiz uh, family. Uh, my parents are actors, but my grandfather was a very famous actor back in the day. And he set up something called Actors Equity, which is the uh, actors union in this country. Mm -hmm. And he also set up the Actors Benevolent Fund. So when I partnered up with Paul, I said, you're with a union boy. And I said, we've got to give these musicians skin in the game. And, uh, and so we have a big royalty department here and we have, I believe, 360 people that we twice wow. yearly do royalties to. And it's a, it's a sizable amount of our outgoings. But it's just, we believe that uh, it's just should be, we've created another revenue stream and we've created another revenue stream for the likes of Oda for Arnold's and, and Leo Abrahams is maybe lesser known, but he's a great guitarist who, okay, well, part of what you do is write songs. Sometimes you just give a lyric sheet and some chords to someone. Sometimes you, you make records and you, you have both sides there, but sometimes you make sounds. You, you can sell those just like you sell your songs, you know? And so this is a, a new, new approach, I think, but, um, Again, a great part of this Spitfire journey. There have been many times like that. You know, I, you know, obviously there was a point where Hans Zimmer rang me up personally and said, do you want to do a, a percussion library? And that was awesome. We've done, I think, six libraries with him. Yeah. And I never thought I could really beat that because as a, a young kid growing up, you know, Hans Zimmer was, was, the, was the dude. And I, I loved also what he's done for orchestral music because he kind of made it cool again. And... Um, and I thought that could have, couldn't have been bettered, but I don't think Hans would mind me saying that it was when Bernard Herrmann's state rang up to see if they could do some work with us. And he is Jesus to media composers. Yeah. Um, and to look through his original scores and to analyze what he'd done and try and recreate his mad world. Well, Christian, I can't thank you enough for having this opportunity. Thanks for coming over. It's been for, great, uh, great for meeting you in person again and, uh, and, and you showing me around Spitfire and it's been really wonderful. Thank you so much. That's brilliant. Cheers, Rick. Yep. Don't forget to subscribe to Christian's channel. I'll put a link in the description below, along with a link to the Spitfire Audio YouTube channel. And remember to subscribe here. Thank you so much for watching.